Hey everybody, Ron Bielefell, Whistling Wings Photography. Welcome to another video. Hope you all are doing well. Coming up on Halloween, then Thanksgiving, then Christmas, then New Year's. Man, another year going on out the window here soon. I want to take this moment to say that I'm still thinking a lot about the folks on... I live in Florida. I'm on the East Coast, and we got lucky here when Ian came through. The folks on the West Coast did not, some of those folks over there, around Sanibel and, and stuff. So I just wanted to say my thoughts are with you all. I hope everybody's recovering the best they can. I've been through it here on the East Coast back in 2004. I know what it's like. Uh, so anyway, moving on from there, the topic of this video is a topic that has come up and that we've talked a lot about on my tours, my clients and I, recently. And it's about autofocus again. Canon systems here, whether it's the R7, the R3, the R5, it doesn't really matter. Even going beyond Canon, but I shoot Canon. And so principally what I'm going to talk about in this video is related to Canon autofocus systems. It seems like autofocus is always on everybody's mind, performance of the autofocus system. And what's come up a lot is people are still struggling with getting their autofocus to do what they want. And that's the point that I make to people a lot is that maybe we shouldn't be thinking so much about what our autofocus systems can do for us but what we can do for our autofocus systems to make them work better, to make them perform at their maximum, autofocus systems nowadays are amazing. There's no question about that, but they're different than in the past. People ask, are asking a lot of their autofocus systems sometimes too much, in my view. So instead, think of it the other way around. What can I do? to make my autofocus system perform better. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. So if you're interested, stay tuned. So let's talk about autofocus systems on Canon cameras, mirrorless cameras. Let's be specific here. The new, newest mirrorless cameras from Canon and they're really amazing autofocus systems. But people, as I said in the intro, are still struggling a bit. And I think it's because their expectations of these autofocus systems are way up here. They see all this stuff online, YouTube videos, whatever, hear everybody else raving about them, and maybe the performance doesn't live up to their, to their expectations, but I think a lot of times we're asking too much of our autofocus systems, and instead we should be looking at what we can do to help our autofocus systems do the job we want them to do. So what can we do? Well... Let's start out with kind of the basics here. And I'm just going to give some examples of things that I've seen. People are struggling and I ask, let's say, to see some of their, you know, show me some images on, on their back of their camera to see where the autofocus was focusing and things like that. And the first thing, or I ask them to send me some images uh, online if we're doing like a zoom call or something like that and what I see a lot is birds that are tiny 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 in the frame tiny in the frame and they have eye detection on and they're wondering and there's a cluttered background and they're wondering why the autofocus system didn't grab the bird didn't grab the bird's eye well first of all you couldn't even see the eye because the bird was really small in the frame so the bird's eye was just minuscule and that, that's one of the first things I think we can do to help out our autofocus systems is bring our subject 
to the point where it's big enough in the frame for the autofocus system to even have a chance to recognize what we want it to focus on. I think that's really, really important. That's, it's kind of the basics. And there's different ways to do that, of course, get closer to your subject, which can be difficult with birds sometimes. Use longer focal length lenses, use a cropped sensor camera like the R7, on um, uh, shorter focal length lenses to get the birds bigger in the frame. Whatever you can do to make your subject stand out, even against backgrounds that might compete with the bird for the autofocus system's attention, that's a good thing. If you're using eye detection, if it's turned on, the autofocus system is going to look for an eye first, then a head, then a body, that kind of thing. If you're asking it to look for an eye, make sure the eye's there for it to find. If you're in a scenario, you're shooting a bird, whatever, uh, any animal, we're talking about bird photography here for the most part, I guess, because I'm a bird photographer for the most part, but wildlife, is there as well. Mammals. If the eye's not there, or you don't expect it to be there very often and available for the autofocus system to find, turn eye detection off. Don't make the autofocus system look for an eye when there's not going to be one there. That's the next thing that you can do is pick the right setup for your autofocus system. Let's talk about that. First of all, pick the right autofocus area or method, depending on which camera you're using, spot versus center point versus different size zones versus eye detection. They're either called methods or areas on the R5. They're called methods on the R3 and the R7. They're called areas, but whatever. Pick the right autofocus setup for your scenario. We just mentioned that. Don't use eye detect if the eye is not going to be there. Use a zone, even a pretty small zone, in the center of the frame if you have cluttered backgrounds. What does a zone do? A zone helps you help the autofocus system focus in on a smaller area of the scene to look for the subject. Making the zone small so it fits the bird better and it's going to exclude a lot of the busy background that's back there. If you're shooting in a busy background scenario, more than likely it's going to help the autofocus system find your subject more often. That's the point of a zone, at least to me. When you're shooting eye detection, it's looking at the entire frame, the entire view that your lens and you are seeing through the viewfinder is being looked at by the autofocus system when you shoot eye detection. Turn it off and go to a zone if you don't have an eye visible or if it's a cluttered background and you want to exclude a bunch of that background, that's going to help your autofocus system do a better job for you. If it's really cluttered and so don't, don't shoot a huge zone, the zone of the entire frame, okay? Get it down toward the center, make the zone smaller, exclude a bunch of the background, have your subject in that zone. Of course, you the subject has to be in there. Birds in flight, I do a lot of birds in flight photography, and you're going to have to keep your bird in that zone for it to focus on it then, of course, but it's a big help to your autofocus system. Specific examples of choosing the right autofocus area or method. I've already talked about if there's, no eye, if there's eyes that are discernible, owls, for example, big brown eyes looking at you using eye detection, no-brainer. Especially if there's no competing close background. But no eye, turn eye detection off. Go to a zone when you have a dirty background. you got a bird flying against close trees, bushes, things like that, zones can really help. Spot autofocus, I use it all the time. I've got a video, a couple videos actually out about setting up the different Canon cameras here for three button, back button autofocus, and one of the buttons is dedicated to spot for a good reason. And that's when you get a bird in a tree or in a bush and there's a ton of competing stuff around it. You try to use eye detect. 
you even try to use zone, it's not going to grab your bird all the time. There's lots of different things that the autofocus system is looking at going, I don't know what this person wants me to focus on. But you put that spot on the bird and away you go. Generally, it's going to choose the bird to focus on and not a branch or a leaf. Now, you got to be careful in the R7 and in the R3 because you can have tracking turned on with spot autofocus and you can basically hit spot, but then it's going to start to try to track. And it's going to look for an eye if you have eye detection turned on and things like that. If you're in a scenario where you want just plain spot because there's a lot of competing stuff in the frame and it's tough to pick out the bird, make sure that tracking is turned off when you're in spot. When you're in spot on the R5, generally speaking, you aren't going to have tracking available. So it's just going to be plain spot and you're good to go. So those are some scenarios that kind of come to mind when you're going to want to pick the appropriate autofocus area or autofocus method to help out your autofocus system. And that brings to the next thing that you can do to help your autofocus system. When do you press your autofocus initiation button, whether it's half press of the shutter button or a back button? Have your subject near the center of the frame, if not right in the center of the frame, when you first ask your autofocus system to look for the subject by pressing either a back button or a half press of your, of your shutter button. If the bird or your subject is way up in one of the corners or way down in one of the corners of the frame, it's less like it looks in the center first. It's center weighted. You keep the bird, you keep your subject in the center of the frame, then you go for autofocus lock for the first time, hit that button. If it's near the center of the frame, you're gonna get lock on the first attempt more often than if you try to press that button for the first time and the bird or your subject is way up in the corner of the frame somewhere, especially for birds in flight. You're going to get better results that way. So that brings us to another thing here about center of the frame being important. If you're trying to track a bird in flight or an animal running, a cheetah running across or something, something fast, action, and you have trouble keeping the bird in the center of the frame or the subject in the center of the frame and it's all over the frame and, and you're, as you're panning, that's making it very difficult, very, very difficult on your autofocus system to figure out what you want to lock on to unless of course it's a blue sky background and that's the only thing obviously there in the frame. But again, we're talking about dirty backgrounds, at least some competing stuff in the background. The more steady your subject is in the frame and the better you can keep it toward the center of the frame, the more likely the autofocus system, when you hit that button to initiate autofocus, the more likely it's going to grab your subject the first time. It's really important. What can you do to help steady things? IBIS IS, turn it on, shoot in mode two for Canon. I shoot mode two a lot now with firmware updates and everything. When I'm shooting action, I like mode two. It's been working really, really well for me. That's IS IBIS on mode two. It stabilizes the viewfinder for you so you can track birds better, but it's also stabilizing the view of that subject for your autofocus system so it can do a better job. It's really a great asset there. The other thing you can do, practice. Practice, practice, practice being stable and smooth when you're panning, keeping your subject near the center of the frame, or if you're gonna to start to compose in frame, get it in the center first, then move your subject to a different part of the frame as you're panning to comp compose in real time, that's fine, but I'm always trying to get initial lock on when the bird or the subject is in the center of the frame. It helps a lot, I find. And when it comes to being steady and panning smoothly, 
there are aids there. If you can't handhold heavier lenses and be steady, there are ways to deal with that. Of course, monopods, tripods, gimbal heads on a tripod, gimbal heads on a monopod. Wimberley's Mono Gimbal Head, I love that thing. I don't like tripods. They're cumbersome, they slow me down, I, I just don't like them. I don't use them unless I absolutely have to, like if we're shooting kingfishers from the kingfisher blind in the wintertime, which I do a lot of. You have to have your camera sticking out, the lens sticking out of the blind at all times. The only way to really do that is on a tripod. But if I'm having to move around, get lower, get higher, move there, move there, get in my car, move, tripods are a pain. Now I do make something called the Speed Shooter Harness. Got to put a plug in here for that. You can get more information in a video. I forget. It's either going to be over here or over here. Some link is going to show up. If you want to know more about the Speed Shooter, it is a great way to stabilize and handhold in a way. Heavy lenses takes all the weight off your arms and hands. Anyway, take a look at it if you're interested. I use it all the time when I'm not in a scenario where I absolutely have to use a tripod. So don't be afraid to take advantage of tripods, monopods, the harness, whatever, to help you stabilize your panning, making it easier on your autofocus system. The other thing about using them is it keeps you fresh. You don't get tired because we all get tired and we start to shake more and more and more as we're having to hold up these heavy lenses over an entire day or even for a few minutes at a time. So using these support aids uh, can keep you from shaking, making it easier on your autofocus to do its job. The next thing that you can do to help out your autofocus system is if you do hit the back button or the half press and the autofocus does not grab your subject the first time, don't just sit there and hold the half press down or hold the back button down and wait for the camera to decide that it's going to retry focusing and looking for a subject again. Pump the button. Hit it, hit it, hit it. Hit it, misses, hit it again, hit it again, hit it again, got it that kind of thing. And once the autofocus locks onto your subject, you hold, if you're using a back button now, you hold that button down and shoot the entire time as you're panning. If you're shooting half press for autofocus initiation, of course, when you start shooting, it's going to hold down the autofocus. So the servo autofocus is going to continue to try to keep your subject in focus. But that's another little thing that people get kind of confused about especially with back button autofocus or with back button autofocus is when you get lock, when the ca camera does get focus on the subject, do you let go because it's locked on now? Or do you have to like keep pumping it every time to get it to hit it, hit it, hit it again when the bird's getting further away or closer? This is a whole nother subject. We'll talk about this in another video. But in general, to get initial lock on, that's what we're talking about here. Hit it, hit the button, half press, back button, if it doesn't grab the subject, hit it again and again and until it does, and then hold and shoot. Don't wait for the camera to decide it's going to refocus because if you have your settings not quite right in your autofocus system settings, it may not retry very quickly and you're going to miss shots. That gets me to the next thing that you can do, and this is an important one, and that how many times have you brought the camera up to your eye on a bird coming at you, flying across, action subject, and it's just a complete fuzzy blob because your autofocus is so far out of where it needs to be. It's either focused way on the background or focused, focused, or focused way on the foreground and where your bird is flying at the time you try to get on it looking through the viewfinder is just so far out of focus that it's just this fuzzy blob. And then you try to get your autofocus, then you hit your autofocus initiation button, again, whether it's half press or back button, and it doesn't grab the bird or your subject. Well, you're asking a lot of your autofocus to, to know that that fuzzy thing in the viewfinder is really what you want. 
especially if they're if it's already locked on a background or a foreground element and it's kind of a cluttered thing you know trees in the background or whatever well woo, what's it supposed to i if i were the autofocus system i wouldn't know what the, what you wanted either pre-focus prior to your shooting opportunities whenever you can get your autofocus focused get your focus focused on something that's kind of at the same distance that you expect your subject to come in many scenarios that's possible to do just focus on a tree out there or something in the water that's in the range of the distance that your bird or your subject's going to show up so that when you bring your camera to your eye your subject is not going to be perfectly focused of course unless you get really lucky but it's going to be discernible as a bird or whatever your subject is to you which makes it easier to get on it and track it accurately but it also makes it much more plain to the autofocus system that that's the subject that he or she wants me to focus on and when you hit that button again when it's near the center of the frame hopefully it's going to choose your subject and it's going to lock onto it the first time pre-focusing to me is so so important the last thing I want to talk about in this video is something a lot of you may not want to hear, but we're talking about Canon here for the most part. These are all the new RF mount camera bodies. These are all RF mounts. They're not all of them, but they are RF mounts, obviously. A lot of you have EF lenses. Some of you really old EF lenses. Some of you more new-ish EF lenses. And you're not getting the performance, the autofocus performance that you think you should, that you were hoping for. Well, the one thing that you can do, another thing that you can do to make your autofocus system better perform for you is to use, these two are RF mount lenses. Use RF mount lenses, especially for action photography, especially at these high, higher, longer focal lengths like 600 millimeters to 100 to 500, there is nothing like using a lens that was made to work with the body you put it on. Using third-party lenses or even using the EF lenses, you're gonna sacrifice speed and accuracy of the autofocus system. I have found that the RF mount lenses, the 600 F4, the 100 to 500, like I just said, work unbelievably well communicating the way they were meant to communicate full channels wide open of communication between the lens and the bodies and that makes a huge difference in autofocus performance now do they work does the ef do the ef lenses work do third-party lenses work yes they work do they work the best they can the best are you going to get the best performance that's possible? No. So if the best autofocus performance, the quickest, the most accurate is absolutely critical to you in your photography, or that's what you want, and you can do it, make the change to RF lenses to go on these RF bodies because you will see a huge performance increase. So... That's really what I wanted to talk about in this video. It's about optimizing the autofocus performance and realizing that the autofocus systems in these cameras, as good as they are, they're not God. They don't know everything about you and what you're trying to focus on and take pictures of. They still need our help to perform at their maximum. So kind of taking the philosophy of turning things around, like I said in the beginning of this video, instead of getting mad at your autofocus system, asking so much of your autofocus system, instead think about, okay, what can I do to help my autofocus system perform at its best? So I hope that this was at least a little bit informative for you. And if you like this video, please subscribe because subscribers keep me coming back and doing more of these videos. So until next time, I hope you have great light. 
I hope you get great images. Be safe out there. I'll see you soon.